so excited today that I'm finally getting to interview Dion Lambert. We've been working on um, putting together this video for a while, but both of us have been busy. Dion has been very busy with the subject of this video. So Dion Lambert, you'll see her bio at the end of this video, but I will just simply say that Dion Lambert is the creator and founder of the May 6th Initiative, which is the subject you probably have already seen in the title of this video. So to start off, how did the May 6th Initiative start? I started my cycle at nine. And so I had been having cycles and periods and whatnot. And right around 22, 23-ish, I started having these weird pains and I was like, mm, this something feels off. It just, it's not right or, you know, whatever. And when I went to the doctor to complain about those things, they dismissed it. They, you know, um, explained it away. They said it was some kind of something that didn't make sense to me. And I'm like, mm. went to the next doctor, made similar complaint a few years later. And they said, um, they gave me a completely different explanation. Also dismissed it, disregarded, oh, it's nothing, just don't worry about it. And in the back of my mind, I was like, I've been having cycles since I was nine years old. I know that something is off and what you're saying doesn't make sense. But they're the doctor, right? They're the professional, they know. Only in recent years did I realize that I am the expert in my own body. They're not the experts of my body. They may be trained in physicality in general, but they don't know about my body. Fast forward, um, those pains wound up being the formation of uh, fibroid tumors cysts, uh, ovarian cysts and fibroid tumors. Um, so last year in April, I had a myomectomy, which is a surgery to remove fibroid tumors. They removed 16 fibroid tumors from my uterus. And it was an open surgery because it had to be because of the size and the volume of them. So it's the equivalent of having a cesarean section. And then they sent me home with five days of pain meds. And when... I've heard you tell this story and I'm still shocked yeah. every time. Yeah, <laughs> five days of pain meds. And on day three, when I was like, okay, this is not getting any better, I called the nurse to find out what I need to do to, to get a refill. And she said, oh, take some Tylenol. I was like, do you want me to come run over your foot with a truck and you take some Tylenol? See how that works. Um, she said, well, just talk to him at your follow-up visit. Granted, my follow-up visit wasn't until seven days after, but they'd only given me five days of pain meds. At that time, I had been meeting with a group of people at OSU. They weren't expecting me to be at the meeting, and so I, I went to the meeting. I called the meeting. I was like, no, we have to meet. We have to talk about this, and I was explaining to them what was going on. I said, my story is just my story, though, and it's easily dismissible. So what do we have to do to get other voices? Because I know I'm not the only one. What do we have to do to elevate other voices um, to find out what their stories are? Because I, this is not fair. It's, it's unnecessary, and there has to be a way. That, that's like my personal motto. There has to be a better way. So um, at that time, Tammy Moore, who is one of the co-directors of the Center for Public Life, she was like, I don't know what this means, but we got to do something. <laughs> and so, and I said, I am not a researcher. I don't know how to do research, but I'm attached to a research institution. So what do we have to do to figure out how to do this research and find out what is happening for the rest of our rest of my community? A few weeks later, she received an invitation to apply for a grant that specifically addressed health inequity. She was like, oh, this is it. And so that's, and the meeting happened on May 6th. And so, thus, the May 6th finished. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing fancy there. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. It's really important to me that this information gets distributed to the public because this subject, it's been a growing movement to make some improvements in the health of the black community. So thank you, Dion that you're here. Thank you for having me. I want to make a disclosure before we start talking about this. I recognize my bias. 
all of my perspective comes from being a white cisgender female. So my perspective is based on, as is the case for every human being, our beliefs are based on our experiences and our interaction with the world. If I've never experienced racism, for one, or medical racism, then it's easy for me to say, oh, that doesn't exist because I haven't experienced it. I need to step out of myself and talk to people that are different than me to get their perspective. And I'm so glad I get to do that with you today. Yay. So part of why I wanted to interview Dion Lambert is I heard a little bit about her story and I said, I need to interview you. <laughs> we need to talk. Number one, I need to say, I am impressed to hear the difference in when Menarch, which is the onset of menstruation mm -hmm. in the black community, is so significantly different mm -hmm. than the white community. My cohorts, it was typically 12, sometimes 14, sometimes 11. Mm -hmm. It's really common in the white community um, for it to start about a year after breast development. So it's really interesting to me as a researcher, as someone interested in maternal health, reproductive and sexual mm -hmm. health, that there is a difference. So in the black <coughs> community, for it's very common that Menarche starts after breast development. Well, if you look at our girls, you know, they're usually starting to pop out right around nine, ten years old. I used to work in an elementary school and those girls look like little women. And a lot of it, I, I feel like now I'm hypothesizing just my own opinion. Yeah. Um, well, go ahead because I'm following up with one of my own. <laughs> drama and trauma in childhood. And so it pushes us to have to mature earlier and mature faster and to handle things a lot quicker. It's almost as if mental maturation is stimulating the body absolutely. too. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I also wondered, because I know I'm an alumni of the Magnet System in Tulsa, so I was introduced to people not looking like me mm -hmm. as far yeah. as interacting with and developing camaraderie and friendships with people in middle school. Yeah. I had already been exposed to the fact that the black community experiences fibroids, uterine fibroids, a lot more mm -hmm. than in the white community. Yeah. I personally don't know anybody. Now, I take that back. I know two. Mm -hmm. I know two people in the white community. And you probably know... Everybody. They're all... <laughs> Everyone I know has been affected by it in some right. way or another. My hypothesis, again, this isn't backed by science, we're just right. talking about our experiences and opinions yeah. in this video, yeah. is it makes me wonder if there's a transgenerational trauma connection oh, to, the, to this perpetuation yeah. of fibroids, the yeah. growth of fibroids. Yeah. How and why do you feel like reproductive and sexual health is different in the black community? <sighs> I don't think we have enough time. Within the black community, there has been so much trauma in so many different areas, from just waking up and trying to walk down the street to our history of sexual abuse, other types of abuse within the home, emotional abuse, lots of different assailants, physical and emotional and psychological and all of that. We battle a lot more. There's a book, but the body keeps the score. And it really talks about how we process trauma in our bodies. And I believe that because of the intergenerational trauma that we've experienced um, through the years, through the centuries, that it carries and it manifests itself in our bodies. And then also, we know that diet plays a, a huge part in our health. And we have been largely living off of a diet that is not where we come from. And a lot of us, because of the trauma, we've been taught to hate our origins. So anything African tends to be looked away from or tends to be shunned because it's not the white standard, candidly. That includes everything, African, unless we're talking about something that is quote unquote cool. You know, when Black Panther came out, everybody had on their African attire. In general, like the way that Africans eat and that our food comes right from the earth and the, you know, the, the types of food that we eat, 
all of that, we were stripped of all that and were given a Western diet, a Western diet of scraps. I mean, literal scraps, eating the intestines of pigs instead of eating the meat, different things like that. So whatever the white folks had left over, they threw to us. And we kind of inherited that and have, have made a cuisine out of it. I believe that that also has impacted our health. So we're starting from a different place even before we get into a hospital system. And then we go into a healthcare system or a hospital system that uses the white body as the standard and then does not even consider the differences in how our bodies are even made and you know our bone densities and our muscle mass. And like we have the same organs, but there, there are subtle differences that have not been studied because why? Why would you? We experience the disparities because it's almost like applying equality, so to speak. You take a tree, it's a universal thing, and you tell three different beings, climb the tree. You're talking about a frog, you're talking about a dog, you're talking about um, an elephant. An elephant, climb the tree. You have the same opportunity, but you're very different, and that's gonna, that process is going to happen very differently. So it's the same when you're applying medical principles across the board. It's like, oh, well, this is the same, and it's all the same. It's, it's really not the same. Those things aren't being taken into consideration. So Exactly. Yeah. There's definitely a very big difference between mm -hmm. equality and equity. Absolutely. There's a meme that I'll put right here. What needs to change and how is the May 6th initiative hoping to do that or already starting to do that? That is a huge question. I mean, we could talk about any one of those questions for an hour each, easily. What needs to change, I would say, is the healthcare system diving a little bit deeper and looking at additional parameters for how they treat people and how they treat their patients. Um, because not all patients are the same. You know, right now, what happens is everyone is painted with a broad brush. You know, it's a body, you know, that has blood, got muscles, got this, got, it's, everybody's the same. So we're gonna treat everybody the same. No, but those systems interact differently and they respond differently. And then I recently was introduced to a book by Dr. Bruce Perry, who is a psychologist, and it's called What Happened to You? The subtitle is Conversations on Trauma, Resilience, and Healing. And one of the links that he makes in his book is about the effect of trauma on our physical bodies how we carry trauma, how we process trauma, how it influences our brain development, how our, our bodies begin to shift based on the stresses that we're experiencing. He gives an example of a young girl who was brought into a hospital and she was in a diabetic coma when she arrived. And they found a way to get her insulin levels stabilized but then her sugar levels would suddenly spike. And, and they're like, what is, is she sneaking food? Is she, you know, is she sabotaging herself? Is she, you know, and so they wound up. Automatically blame the patient. Automatically blaming the patient. And so because of these things and they couldn't figure it out, they called for a psyche valve to see why she was damaging herself. <clears throat> and in the psyche valve, Dr. Perry was having a conversation with her and then he noticed you know, every time an ambulance rode by, that her sugar levels would spike, she would become almost catatonic, and what it wound up being is that her friend was shot. They were sitting in a park, her friend was shot, the ambulance came and got her, she was dead. When she was in the hospital, every time an ambulance rode by, she heard the ambulance, it caused a stress response, which made her sugar levels go up. Dr. Perry noticed this and told her doctors, well, have you, did you ask her about any of her recent experiences or any histories of trauma or whatever like that? No. And she was like, well, no, they didn't ask me any of that. And he's like, well, yeah, of course, why would they? So they moved her to the other side of the hospital and they were able to get her sugar levels stable. Yeah. So much that happens. So I would say in general, 
consider something other than what's physically presenting you. Ask those background questions, ask those probing questions to find out, you know, we talk about, you know, the social determinants of health and all of the different, uh, the environment, the people that you interact with, the type of work you do, all of those different things play a huge factor in our health. And so considering that, how the May 6th initiative does any of that, one, we have to get the stories. We have to find out what are people experiencing? What have they experienced? What are they going through? Again, how this whole thing started was with my story. And I was like, my story is easily dismissed though. So what do we, you can ignore me, but you can't ignore an entire community. So what do we have to do to make those things happen? And so what the May 6th initiative is doing is starting by collecting those stories and really looking at what's happening in each of those things to identify themes and, and to, to pull out the, the common denominators, if you will, and to try to figure out how to come to the table with our health care partners and have real conversations about their policies, practices, and procedures and make recommendations to change those. Yay, let's Yay. do that. Yes. And yeah. start asking those holistic questions. Yeah. So describe for the people, for instance, the three stages mm. that the May 6th initiative is mm. going to be doing. The grant was for three years, funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> it's a three-year grant cycle and um, is also going to be a three-year process. In the first year, we are laying a foundation for organizing because that is also a principle to teach the community how to advocate for itself and how to push for change. We are employing the amazing Greg Robinson the second. Yeah, he's amazing, an amazing organizer, the organizer of organizers. And so he's teaching organizing to everyday folks. You don't have to have a um, background in organizing. You don't have to, skill, have to have the skills already. That's what he's teaching. Fundamentals of organizing, power mapping, asset mapping, learning how to write policy recommendations because it's a strategic organizing. It's everybody does activism in their own way. So some people are, you know, some people go protest, some people go march, some people go, you know, every, and, and some people do all of it. But our approach is that of being strategic and really like how do we get behind the curtain and get to the table with those who actually have decision making power. At the end of the first year or at the end of that first nine, ten months, uh, that's when we'll start reaching out to the community to collect the stories. In the second year is when we start to analyze the data that's been collected in, at the end of the first year. In the third year, after we've identified the themes and analyzed the data and come up with uh, recommendations, now we're going to the table with the healthcare partners. One of those partners doesn't have the best reputation in the black community. And when that particular health system is mentioned, eyes roll and, you know, it's like, ugh, you know. So, so it's huge for them to be at the table and to have committed to taking a look at their policies, practices, and procedures. And so that is what the third year is. As we come to the table, we have you know those difficult and challenging conversations about what patients have been experiencing, you know, what are some things that, that led up to those particular outcomes or experiences, and how can they make those things different. And so the healthcare partners have agreed already to take a look at those things wow. and to make adjustments you know, as they're able to. And of course, being the group that we are, led by those that we are, it's not just gonna be, oh, as we're able. It's like, no, we're gonna push for these particular changes. Hopefully, those will lead to some, some better outcomes for their black patients. So, Dion, if you will tell folks how they can participate in this change or yeah. interact with the information or just find more information, what yeah. could you tell them? We just finished the application process for the cohort itself. One way to possibly get involved is like when we have our midweek sessions, we'll be incorporating local artists and local, you know, creators and things like that, as well as policymakers and uh, influencers in the community and different things like that. Um, so that the cohort um, can interact with those in the community who are already doing the change. I will share my email. We do have a link to 
sign up to share your story. I don't really want to make a question of this, but I just mm -hmm. want to leave a space yeah. for you. Here's the deal. When I first began experiencing those pains in my 20s, I really didn't understand that I could advocate for myself or that I should advocate for myself. Because my health was like literally in someone else's hands, I didn't want to piss them off and I didn't want to irritate them and I didn't want to um, do anything that might make them do or say something or whatever that would cause me to have to go through additional unnecessary pain. So it's like, okay, you're the doctor, you're the professional, so I'm just going to take your word for it and I'll do my own research outside of here, um, which obviously didn't lead anywhere because 20 years later I'm having a surgery to have those things removed. It's really important to understand and to know that you can advocate for yourself. You can speak up and you should because if you don't, who will? If you don't have a person with you in the office, another thing for me that happened uh, last year during the pre-op visits and whatnot uh, in preparation for the surgery is that I took white people with me to the appointments to, and I felt absolutely um, livid and vulnerable and I had so much rage that I felt like I had to do that. Um, in order to have them speak to someone that they would deem as an equivalent and that they deemed would know what they were talking about because I have been historically like disregarded and so my voice was not valued in that office space or not valued in that assessment space. It's my body, but my voice is not valued. And so I took white folks with me to echo literally what I was saying and so they could, oh, okay, and that's what happened every time. So the other piece is do what you have to do to protect yourself. Hopefully what we're doing will lead to changes that, that make that obsolete, make that practice something that doesn't have to be. My mom teaches medical assisting. So when she goes in and she's talking her lingo and whatnot, you know, they're thrown off because they don't think that someone who looks like her is gonna be able to talk to them in their language. Um, but then things begin to shift. But what about folks that don't have that background? What about folks that don't have that lingo? What resources can be used in order to make sure that the medical professional will um, not only hear but honor what is being said in those appointments with those patients? For me, it was taking a white person. That was the shortest means to the end. Um, trying to figure out the lingo and how to say it in a way that... It, like, I have a friend who is here and willing to go with me to the doctor, so let's go. And they, and they did that. So, but it was heartbreaking. And, 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 and you shouldn't have to do and that. And I should not have to do that. But speak up for yourself, <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in essence. Feel like you can. And even so, if you know someone who's struggling with some health things and is struggling with the motivation to go address it or investigate it, mm -hmm be a support to them, mm -hmm. encourage them to go, mm -hmm. go with them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need support from our community members or friends or family mm -hmm. to make the steps that we need to do for ourselves. And honestly, like I'm thinking about how there are or were individuals who would accompany um, patients to like Planned Parenthood you know, in order to be that shield, to be that buffer, to be that, because that's, that's hard, it's a hard thing to do. Those are hard visits to make in our judgmental and um, misogynistic community. The world that we live in um, as a whole does not value women's voices, let alone black women's voices. Black men as well is not just about women. It's not just about, when we hear reproductive health, we automatically think maternal health. Maternal health doesn't happen without the man. We're not inseminating ourselves, so the men are involved in this as well. But even outside of that, they have their own health challenges with, prost with their prostate. And, the, and so there's, there's a, and, and the psychology around it, and the, well, I'm not even gonna talk about the mental health aspect right now. Black reproductive health is not just about the black mothers. It is about the black men. It is, it is also about the decision to not have children. So whether male, female, non-binary, whatever it is, 
every black body is included in the May 6th initiative, and we want to hear from every black body who's been affected by medical racism and health inequity. So. so like I said in the beginning, I have my own implicit bias, because we all do. I want to make sure that I leave space for you to say, is there anything I'm forgetting? Is there anything that I didn't ask that's like vital to this conversation? Again, this is a conversation that could happen for days and days, years and years. I think the biggest parts of what we're doing today is really just to bring awareness and to let people know that something is happening to try to change things, include as many voices as possible in the process. And uh, we want to make sure that we have everybody at the table. I think that's the most important part, is just remembering to let folks know what's happening and that we want all black voices to be included. And to be heard. And to be heard. Right. Yeah. It's not limited to your responsibility to act because allies yes. can do so much. Absolutely. We don't have to be the helper going with to the appointment we can just speak out. Here is a space for all voices to be heard. Yeah. So it's like being um, a healthcare doula. You know, someone who helps guide someone through the process and speaks up and advocates for them as much as possible, without, you know, stepping over those lines, just helping them get to the finish line. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm really grateful to not yeah. only be able to share some time with you yeah. because with the initiative, your life has gotten very busy. Very, very, very. And so luckily we squeezed in some time <laughs> to get this done. Yes. And I'm grateful that I always get to learn more from you. Mm. So thank you. I'm grateful to have a space and to have a platform. It's interesting because it started out with my story, listening to some of the stories that have come in and we haven't even gotten to the story collection part yet, officially, but just, you know, listening to, even to some of the cohort members, like, oh, yeah, I remember because I don't know, sign me up, you know. Um, but so many people are affected by this. To watch it grow from my story and my anger and my rage and my disappointment and my frustration and all that to, like, empowering a community um, or, you know, illuminating the power within the community to share their own voices, that it's... Um, it gets me choked up. Again, I'll remind you that her bio is going to be at the end of this. Um, be sure to check out the links, check out the information. You don't have to do anything, but if you feel motivated, take advantage of the motivation. Yeah. Help us do more work on this and improve the lives for everyone. Because if the health of black Americans is improved, then it's so much more likely that everyone's life is improved. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. That was such a fun, fantastic, information-filled interview. I'm so grateful to Dion. I just can't say the words. Um, so, if you're interested, there was some bloopers involved in this. Of course, you know, I typically show my own bloopers when I record videos. Uh, but there was some fun ones. So if you're interested in seeing that, look for the next video. I'm going to reprise uh, Greg Robinson's bio at the end. There's also some links to help balance out the fact that we don't have any May 6th initiative information to share. So check into that. And as always, please be kind to all your fellow human beings, no matter their diversity. Every single one. Thank you.